Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, no matter where you are in the world. Welcome to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Young Members Group ADR World Tour. Arbitration and mediation as a global force for good. We'll get started in just a few moments. Welcome to all. Please use the chat function to let us know where you're calling in from today. China and Scandinavia are close in relation, um, but far in distance. So we want to know where you are. <laughs> well, I'm just going to call out Jaya. Jaya is calling in from Madison, Wisconsin. She's a member of the Central Organizing Group. <laughs> Welcome, Jaya. Thank you. Get us started. Wake, wake us up on the East Coast and Central Time, USA. We'll begin in just a few moments while attendees continue to roll in. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one more minute. Welcome everybody. This is the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators ADR World Tour. We are in week seven, Scandinavia and China. Uh, we've completed uh, tours in Asia and I see Yulin is calling in from Beijing. Welcome Yulin. Um, and we moved to Central America and the Caribbean, South America, Africa, Europe. Last week we were in India and this week China, Scandinavia. We'll be moving to the Middle East and Turkey next week. Uh, there's 11 regions and we are pleased to have all of you here today. Thank you for your participation at the Charter Institute of Arbitrators ADR World Tour. All right, let's get started. Um, so welcome again to everybody. My name is Brian Brannon and I serve on the board of directors of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators North America branch and its Young Members Group Steering Committee. On behalf of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Young Members Group, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Young Members Group ADR World Tour Arbitration and Mediation as a Global Force for Good. The Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Young Members Group presents 11 regional webinars, which highlight the unique importance and efficiencies ADR plays in allowing the world's economy to remain operative and functional, even during times of great economic uncertainty. Perhaps no greater time of economic uncertainty has ever existed than today. 11 regional webinars will take place, which focus on ADR and access to justice, ADR as a means to strengthen the rule of law, and ADR as an efficient alternative to traditional litigation. As mentioned, we are in week seven of the ADR World Tour. The ADR World Tour is powered by 18 volunteers. Today, I am pleased to be joined with, by two of them, Kirsten Teo, based in Washington, DC, and David Chung, based in New York, New York. They will moderate today's session and have organized two legs of the ADR World Tour, Asia, China, and Scandinavia. Kirsten, David, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for the kind introduction. Welcome again to the ADR World Tour China Scandinavia Week. Um, so I'm David Chung, currently serving as a fellow with the American Bar Association. And we, uh, Kirsten Teo and myself will be your co-moderator for today. Um, since Brian already gave you the background, uh, let me start with what happened yesterday, since this is the second day of the week. For those uh, who missed the first webinar, we had a meaningful discussion under the theme of arbitrating for peace based on the unique relationship between China and Scandinavia, we discussed how arbitration has worked as a medium and contributed to promoting peace, not only between the two regions, but also around the world and why it is still so important. Following from there, today is the second day of the series and we will be covering the latest arbitration developments and trends in both regions. And we have an excellent panel here with us. Uh, before introducing them, just a few notes on housekeeping. We plan the session to last around 60 minutes, but depending on how it flows, we may 
stay a little longer. We will start with initial presentations by the panelists. Each will be given around 10 minutes to cover their topics. Then we will open the floor for the remaining. For any questions, please leave them in the Q&A box so that we can go through after the presentations. Oh, one more thing. Uh, there'll be some poll questions popping up during the transitions. Please kindly take those as many as you can, which will probably take only 20 seconds for each. And you'll be playing a great part in the comparative studies on ADR development around the world. Lastly, please also notice that views expressed by the speakers today are all made solely for the purpose of this webinar in their individual capacity, unless otherwise expressed. Now, um, let's turn to our first distinguished panelist, Kirsten. Great, thank you, David. Indeed, we are delighted that our message of arbitrating for peace has resonated with many, and we will continue to live up to the legacies of our former generations uh, in today's world. As a roadmap of the panel's presentation for today's webinar on the topic of arbitration developments in China and Scandinavia, we will today get to hear updates from Anna Maria, Dr. Chen, Evelina, and Ji Yun. It is my pleasure to now introduce Ms. Anna Maria Temenin. Anna Maria currently represents parties in national and international commercial and investment arbitrations, administrative and civil litigations in Finland and Sweden, including setting aside proceedings related to um, arbitration matters before the courts uh, and, and related to an investment treaty award pending before the European Court of Justice. Anna Maria is experienced in mediating, arbitrating and litigating high stakes commercial and investment disputes often consisting of parallel proceedings in the fields of general commercial law, international sales, post m and &E, telecoms, competition, international investment, pharmaceuticals, and energy. She has arbitrated cases under various institutional rules, SCC, ICC, FAI, Vienna, LCIA, DIA, Uncitral, and PCA. Anna Maria also acts as an arbitrator. She has sat as sole arbitrator, co-arbitrator, and chairperson in over 20 international arbitrations under various institutional rules. She is an alternate member of the ICC Court of Arbitration representing Finland in scrutinizing both commercial and investment treaty awards, as well as appointing arbitrators as part of the ICC Court's work. Anna Maria is trained in both common and civil law legal systems and is admitted to practice as an attorney both in Finland and the state of New York. I now warmly invite Anna Maria to introduce the Swedish Arbitration Association in her capacity as an executive committee member. Anna Maria, please. Many thanks, Kirsten, um, and thanks for the, the uh, invite to attend uh, for the SCAA, which is the Swedish Arbitration Association, which I have uh, the pleasure of uh, representing here today as one of its executive committee members. Um, the Swedish Arbitration Association is an organization for lawyers worldwide uh, engaged in the practice and theory of arbitration. So uh, the listeners are, all, of course, welcome to join also the Swedish Arbitration Association if the developments of arbitration is especially in the Nordics, are, are of interest. Um, the SAA organizes perhaps as um, two of its most important, uh, if, if I can say so, um, events um, are perhaps the Swedish Arbitration Days organized every second year, uh, which unfortunately last year could not take place uh, physically uh, and turned into a smaller scale webinar as, as most events. Um, and then also the, uh, the SAA organizes together with the SEC an arbitrator uh, training program um, in, in Sweden, where, uh, for example, Finns like me have been able to participate, although it's in, in Swedish, every second year as well. Um, and that has uh, obviously benefited the market in terms of uh, providing better, um, better knowledge for uh, new and upcoming arbitrators. Um, and so I think that's, in, in a nutshell, uh, what the SAA does, in addition to hosting uh, seminars and webinars for its members. I definitely encourage uh, members and viewers to join the SAA if you're interested. Um, I, I think the SAA has, has been um, a front runner in providing educational opportunities. I would not have had a chance to study in Stockholm otherwise. And during my time in Stockholm, thinking about it now, it's been five years. Um, um, there was a lot of discussion and debate on the revision of the Swedish Arbitration Act. And I understand that finally it has come to fruition. I'd be grateful, Anna Maria, if you could share with us some key updates, highlights on the revised uh, Swedish Arbitration Act. Yes, thanks, Kirsten. So the new law entered into force on the 1st of March uh, 2019, but obviously there was a lot of uh, development work in the background. 
Um, and perhaps as a, a little bit of a segue, uh, the previous law dated from, from the 1990s, and although it had been influenced by the institutional model law, it's not a strict model law uh, country as such. Um, and uh, the, the key idea behind the new Arbitration Act was to make uh, arbitration process more efficient um, and then many elements that we've seen being incorporated into arbitral rules uh, over the past years uh, or the past decade or so have also made it um, in, into the Arbitration Act, uh, say, for example, for multi-contract and multi-party uh, situations in the form of consolidation. Um, and, and for example, appointment of arbitrators in those situations. So that, that would be uh, some, some of the background. Um, but perhaps um, some of the, the issues that I would raise um, uh, would be that, uh, for example, the new act gives arbitrators explicit mandate to determine the applicable substantive law in the absence uh, of party agreement, uh, which, uh, I mean, is often contained in, in arbitral rules when the parties have agreed on arbitral rules, but uh, in ad hoc situations, it is going to be uh, an important provision as well. Um, then on the grounds for challenge, uh, also as a result of uh, an increase in the number of challenges that we've seen in the past years, uh, the grounds for challenging an arbitral award uh, were revised to require, um, in an excess of mandate cases, uh, proof that the the, the excess of mandate would have affected the outcome of the case um, and in order uh, for, for a set aside or challenge application um, to be successful. Uh, so that is actually um, a, a sort of narrowing down uh, the grounds for, for challenge and set aside and making sure that, um, that parties do not um, argue excess of mandate with, without actually specifying how it would have impacted the award. Um, and staying on the topic of challenge, um, one way of sort of streamlining uh, the sort of proceeding would also be to shorten the time within which an award can be challenged. Um, and that time went down to two months. Um, so that is the time that our parties are left with um, if they if they are going to sort of um, challenge an award, which. Uh, obviously, in, in practical terms, has quite some significance because once you get the award, uh, the parties have to um, have to understand what it says um, and then go through the motions. And if you then have to sort of find, uh, for example, Swedish Council to do that um, uh, and then actually file the the application itself, uh, you have to get going uh, early enough. Um, and, and perhaps as an internationally interesting development is also that part of the challenge procedure can be undertaken in English uh, without interpretation into Swedish, which is more of a sort of cost efficiency point uh, from an international perspective. Um, and I think this caters especially to investment treaty related cases where council often um, are, are sort of non-Swedish council. Um, and in that sense, uh, that facilitates the uh, or um, lowers the threshold a little bit. Um, and then perhaps uh, when we're talking about, um, because for example, challenge proceedings would go to the, uh, the Court of Appeal as a first instance, and then to the Supreme Court later on, uh, then the revised act introduces a leave to appeal requirement, uh, which enables the Supreme Court to limit its examination to issues of precedential value. Um, so this also streamlines the process and make sure that uh, um, that these things um, do, do not go on for, for longer than they need to. Uh, but in essence, most of the provisions in, in the Arbitration Act um, serve the purpose of streamlining the proceedings and making them more efficient. Definitely. I think the rules have also uh, catered to developments over the past years. And so it's modernized the Swedish arbitration regime. I think, you know, people have criticized uh, arbitration for not being able to cater to multi-party, multi-arbitration situations. And now the SAA does provide for such a mechanism to consolidate the, the arbitrations. So that's definitely a good sign. Um, Exactly, and uh, and that's also reflective of the, the sort of commercial realities of today. Um, is that often contracts are interrelated, um, and then now also courts have the ability to handle these. Although uh, most of these uh, or most of the arbitrations in Sweden would still be uh, subject to, for example, uh, the SEC rules, and there the, that that possibility has also existed. Um, Right. Uh, I'm just curious, when the, the, the applications are before the courts in Sweden, will the um, jurisdictional award be heard de novo, uh, afresh, or will it uh, take into consideration the tribunal's uh, findings and 
decision on the jurisdiction. So the court has the ability to, to review, um, but I would say that, that no court goes sort of entirely uninfluenced as to, to what, uh, what the tribunal has decided. Wonderful. Thank you. So uh, segueing now from the revised SAA, we want to explore further the updates on the intra-EU BIT developments. And Anna, you know, you have this case fascinating before the ECJ. Uh, perhaps you could, could give us some insights on developments from the ISDS perspective in Scandinavia. Yeah, so I mean, from um, from the ISDS perspective, I, I think we're sort of seeing um, two interesting developments um, in in the in the Nordic sphere, um, and uh, and one is the sort of a debate around intra EU uh, bilateral investment treaties, um, which is which has been a sort of topical issue, especially in Stockholm, because there are quite a few um, arbitral awards uh, issued under the SEC rules in proceedings seated in Sweden uh, that are now subject uh, to challenge before the Swedish courts as a result of the Achmea uh, decision by the European Court of Justice uh, in 2018. Um, and uh, there are a number of arbitral awards uh, against uh, EU member states that have challenged um, that have been challenged before the Swedish courts, uh, one uh, against uh, the Republic of Poland, um, some against uh, the Kingdom of Spain um, and, and Italy. Um, and, and these are sort of cases that are pending um, and the, the Swedish Supreme Court referred in, in the Polish case uh, the question to the European Court of Justice um, and the hearing in that case will be uh, taking place now in March. Um, so th these are uh, these are interesting times in terms of, of these developments. And I, what I would, um, and, and, and the sort of, uh, there are cases both under uh, BITs uh, and the ECT. Um, so um, there, there are two sets of questions uh, that, that are interesting from that perspective. And then I think the, the other development uh, in relation to ISDS, uh, sort of broader in the Nordics, uh, to which I would include then um, Sweden, Denmark, Norway. Um, and as a, as a Finn, um, uh, I think this is where the countries are a little bit distinguished from one another. Um, but uh, there's been cases against the Nordic countries uh, in the past year. So in 2020, uh, we saw uh, an ISDS case brought uh, against Sweden. Um, and actually here, I think I can share the, the names of, of the cases with you. Um, let's see, here we go. Can you see that? Yes. Good. Um, so you can see here uh, on, on the slide uh, the cases that have been brought against Nordic countries in, in the past year. Um, so there's an ECT case uh, against Sweden that relates to Sweden's ban on uranium mining. Um, and uh, then there are cases uh, against Norway and Denmark um, under BITs. Um, and, and here it's good to note that, the, uh, that Norway uh, is not an EU member state, so uh, the questions that were previously addressed um, are not necessarily relevant there. Um, and these are also exit cases um, in, in that context. Um, uh, and so I think this is a new development uh, that, that we're seeing, uh, that there are sort of Nordic countries subject to, to these types of claims. Um, and uh, this is perhaps where, as a, as a Finn, I can say that so far Finland has avoided uh, being subject to these claims. But uh, if, uh, if the trend is anything to go by, then uh, it, we could expect that to happen also also in Finland um, at, at some point. So I think those would be the points that I would bring up on, on the ISDS side. Absolutely, that's fantastic. So we can see fair and equitable treatment, most favored nation clauses being considered. Um, and one, one question uh, before I go to the, one of the questions from the pet, uh, attendees, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's been also a backlash on the rising costs and arbitration, whether it's a commercial case or an investment, the cost of arbitration is definitely on the rise. So one uh, aspect that has suddenly gained in popularity is this um, aspect of third party funding. Um, in some countries, this is not permissible, whereas other uh, countries like Singapore, they only uh, created uh, an avenue for funding for arbitrations, not other uh, you know, litigation cases. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on how TPF has developed in Scandinavia, if any. 
So I think litigation uh, funders started to sort of show up uh, on the doors of Nordic clients and, and Nordic law firms uh, maybe um, a few years ago uh, more actively. Uh, and I think in, you know, uh, as, as usual, uh, the development started in Stockholm. So uh, we've seen uh, some cases on the market that that have been funded. Um, I think what what is sort of interesting is that in the past few years, uh, we've also seen sort of funders being uh, present in the Nordic market. So there's a there are funders based in Stockholm uh, and and for example in Oslo uh, that are acting uh, in in the region. Um, and obviously um, because the number of sort of very large um, either commercial. Uh, or investment treaty cases is, is very limited in the Nordics, um, then they're all, they're all the international players uh, that would set foot here if, if the claim is big enough. But for the purposes of the Nordic market, we're seeing also funders that are funding um, lower threshold cases um, and um, or lower value cases um, that, that it, there's perhaps more of a market for in, in the Nordics. Um, and I think uh, just like the developments everywhere else in the world, um, it's so far very unregulated, whether it's from the perspective of what the funders may do, uh, but also from the perspective of, of the arbitration or the litigation. So there are uh, there are no local bar rules uh, yet. And, and there, I think that's where we're getting to the discussion of um, what is permissible, what are the sort of uh, rules that you have to play by uh, in these cases. And I think this is also where sort of um, even the Nordic bar rules differ uh, from one another in terms of, of what is permissible uh, from the perspective of, of the law firm, for example. So I think this is a development that we will we will see um, take more foothold uh, going forward to what extent remains to be seen. Great, thank you. It's definitely something we look forward to. We need to stay tuned and monitor developments, um, especially as we put in place soft guidelines. Um, because on the one hand, you want access to justice, but on the other hand, you don't want it to be um, an interference, an additional interference in the management and strategy of the case. Um, there, is, there is a question from the attendees, uh, if I may uh, share it with Anna Maria. Uh, one of the questions uh, posed is this. Uh, does the SAA publish commercial arbitration awards after adaptation? Um, so no, the, the SAA uh, does not, um, uh, as an association, uh, sort of produce uh, awards as such. Um, but there are, uh, through the SEC's website, uh, available all sorts of information on the developments in Sweden. Um, and I think actually Evelina may be better, uh, better off at uh, discussing those. Perfect. Uh, I did share the link to the SEC Institute uh, Digital Library on the court decision. Yeah, exactly. Perhaps, but perhaps, but Evelina, if you wanted to uh, jump in to say a few words about this. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry to, to hijack uh, your presentation, Anna Maria. Uh, just a brief word. Like you mentioned, we have a digital library provided on our website where we um, publish in awards of interests, basically. So. Um, and should you not be able to find the award you are looking for, please don't hesitate to contact the SEC and we will take a look at it and hopefully be able to help you. Thank you. Thank you, Evelina. And for those who are interested, uh, there's also an arbitration portal. I'm just going to share the link at, at this juncture. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, please keep them coming on the chat box. We welcome them. Um, so thank you so much, Anna Maria. Um, I, I suppose one last question to wrap it up. Um, what do you think are go uh, is going to be the most interesting facet looking ahead? Uh, what would be one of the key issues in arbitration in Scandinavia? Going forward, I, I think, you know, it, it depends a little bit on, on what we see, uh, whether it's commercial or, or investment side. Um, I think uh, there is going to sort of, on the commercial side, um, I think how the, the Nordic markets will adapt uh, to the current COVID situation and whether we're going to see um, cases uh, that have, you know, substantive impact is going to be interesting, um, but then also um, how we as practitioners uh, manage uh, manage these cases and whether we can go, for example, fully digital more easily. Um, I, I think it's certainly something that, that I would uh, hope to see that, that we maintain the developments that have been made in the past year. Um, and, and then I think on the investment side, um, it, it's going to be interesting to see uh, where, where we see the developments um, and, and whether, for example, this question on, on the EU 
um, impact is going to have an impact on, on Stockholm as a seat. Um, and, and then also what these ISDS cases against the Nordics, uh, where we're going to end up there. So it remains to be seen. Thank you so much, Anna Maria. And I invite everyone to stay tuned to Evelina's presentation on the SEC as she shares with us the digital platforms the SEC has developed, uh, especially particularly pertinent in this COVID years. So please stay tuned for Evelina's presentation on that. Um, at this juncture, I hand it over to my co-host, David. David, please. Thanks, Kirsten. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Kirsten. Um, thank you also, Anna Maria, well, for sharing the current arbitration trends and developments in Scandinavia. Your insights uh, were very um, helpful. <laughs> and now um, we'll turn to Dr. Chen to hear about the latest arbitration developments in China. Um, my apologies, there were some technical issues, so we can't see him on video, but I just confirmed that he can still speak. So we're gonna um, move on. So, uh, Dr. Chen Jian is the Vice Secretary General of the China Academy of Arbitration Law. Dr. Chen has been enlisted and served as an arbitrator with many Chinese institutions and also a number of international arbitration, arbitral institutions here in more than 100 cases. Prior to that, he was the Director of the International Case Management Department of CTAC, which is the representing arbitral institution in China. During his time with CTAC, he oversaw more than a thousand cases and he has extensive speaking and lecturing experiences as well. And he's, uh, he's also a prolific uh, writer on commercial arbitration issues. So we have someone here who can really tell us about uh, the past, the current and the future of Chinese arbitration. Dr. Chen, uh, what would be the latest hot topics in China? Thank you very much, David. Do you hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you clearly. I'm so sorry that there's a technical issue that uh, uh, you cannot see my uh, 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 my actual experience uh, 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 appearance. So sorry about that. But at the very beginning of uh, my talk and the very beginning of this year of the OX, uh, I'd like to wish everybody uh, Every one of you, uh, uh, a harvest, a good a bumper harvest, and uh, good health for all of you and your family members. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Chen. <laughs> uh, turning back to what I am supposed to, to share with you, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, at first introduce a little bit about uh, CAAL. CAAL, China uh, Academy of Arbitration Law, uh, is not a body to do research itself. It is an academic uh, association of the practitioners and the researchers involved in commercial arbitration in China, including uh, members from law firms, uh, professors of universities, uh, uh, case managers of uh, arbitration institutions, and uh, uh, independent arbitrators and others. It was founded uh, in 2004 and later uh, formally registered with the Minister of uh, Just, uh, Justice uh, uh, in the year 2006. Uh, uh, so far, uh, it has uh, over 1,060 members, including uh, the big institutions of arbitration, uh, such as CTEC, NASIMAC, and others, and the enterprises like Sanopec, law firms like uh, uh, Kenwood and others, and the, the famous uh, scholars and the experts in China, like um, uh, professors and Sabar and uh, Huang Jin, or, or, or people like that. At present, the CIL has um, around 15 sub uh, commissions on this uh, specific field of uh, commercial arbitration, such as uh, uh, construction arbitration. Uh, intellectual property arbitration and a number of others. Uh, so far, about a very uh, brief introduction of uh, CAL. And uh, next, I'd like to introduce to you a little bit about a little bit about the arbitration um, uh, arbitration 
So if you're in channel, uh, first of all, let me give you a little bit uh, uh, the statistics of uh, channel. In the year uh, 2018, the overall caseload in China was uh, 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 500, a little uh, uh, more than 500. And that was uh, an increase of uh, more than 100 percent of last year. And, and then the next year, that the, in the year of, of uh, 2019, the overall uh, the overall caseload uh, was uh, higher, and uh, it was an uh, increase by. Uh, 100,000. By the way, so far, there are 2,253 two institutions in China uh, with uh, only CTAC and the CMAC were the national ones. The others were local institutions located in different uh, uh, cities in China. Uh, including the Beijing Option Commission in Beijing. As for the uh, different uh, types of uh, disputes uh, referred to these um, institutions in application, they cover disputes uh, arising from real estate transactions, uh, ordinary sales of goods, uh, rent, uh, 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 merger and acquisition uh, transactions, uh, insurance uh, disputes, uh, and even uh, disputes concerning the um, transactions on agricultural uh, businesses. Of course, uh, e-commerce is uh, becoming more and more important a source of uh, uh, disputes uh, referring to um, arbitration. But that's a very rough introduction of the different types of uh, uh, disputes referred to arbitration in, CITA, uh, in, in China. Uh, well, I'm sorry that uh, we haven't got the uh, overall statistics of uh, China in last year. Uh, although uh, it is estimated that the overall statistics should be higher than the year before last. Uh, it is for sure that uh, the statistics for uh, online arbitration should be much higher, much higher, uh, substantially than the year before last. Well, actually, before the uh, um, great uh, pandemic, uh, online arbitration was already uh, carried out in in, in China, uh, but uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, and the application in China uh, uh, became somehow uh, prosperous. More and more institutions are engaged in uh, online application. More and more uh, platforms or uh, online uh, infrastructures were built for online application by more institutions. Uh, more and more institutions are also uh, making up for new rules of arbitration for online arbitration. Dr. Chen, it's, it's yeah. obvious that um, arbitration in China, the market is growing. Um, mm -hmm. what, what will be the success factors? What, what do you think the key success factors are? Uh, well, of course, um, the uh, rapid growth of the economy or commerce is a very important factor, or the first important factor. Uh, and the, for the year, uh, for last year, uh, the, specific, uh, the, the special factor is the pandemic. Because of the pandemic, uh, it is uh, difficult to uh, hold uh, offline hearings, and at the same time, uh, the, the, the economy has made great difficulties and for the different uh, business uh, entities and uh, merchants, uh, 
ordinarily those disputes which can be uh, negotiated and settled became uh, uh, difficult to be settled and hard to go to arbitration. For some of those cases, actually there was no real disputes between the parties, but uh, it, it was uh, the problem for the debtor to pay the debt in time. And so um, for the creditor, he just have to uh, start up the, um, uh, the legal proceedings to get the actual award uh, to uh, even go through the enforcement stage. And that's another fa important factor. I think these are the two important factors. Of course, uh, if we talk about uh, online arbitration, uh, the uh, boosting of uh, e-commerce and uh, the, uh, uh, the the habit of people uh, uh, going uh, online shopping is an important factor, especially for the new generations, for the young guys. Uh, th th that's the third factor, I believe. Uh, I think this was the important factors uh, for the boosting of uh, uh, arbitration China. Well, there, there may be a fourth one, but that is not the uh, the major one in, uh, in the long run. But in the short run, uh, because of the uh, very heavy caseload with the, the court system, so the court system uh, has been encouraging the uh, uh, more use of uh, commercial arbitration. Uh, the case load in the court system becomes serious because uh, judges becoming uh, less because of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 legitimacy le legitimation actually uh, the state system um, intentionally cut down the number of judges. Uh, there, uh, of course, uh, if a, a few more words used to be said is that. They intend to make the judge a smaller pool with a higher and better social standard and uh, reward. And uh, of course, their capacity uh, is limited anyway. And so they would encourage more disputes to go to arbitration. I think that's uh, the, 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 those were the factors. Uh, to uh, influence the, uh, the development of commercial arbitration in China. And of course, China is such a vast country and a vast economy, and the bulk of uh, arbitration uh, becomes so um, uh, specific and uh, uh, the eye catching in the world because it, it, its quantity is so big. Uh, but if it is uh, um, divided by the different institutions, then the case may be different. For example, uh, in America, uh, the American Arbitration Association handles uh, even a higher quantity of caseload uh, by any of the institutions of arbitration in China, uh, if uh, by individual institutions. But the overall uh, uh, statistic is so big that, uh, and it becomes uh, uh, so uh, attaching and the, um, so important. It's, even a, a lot of foreign people, foreign experts uh, are so impressed by that. Well, uh, next, I think I'd like to uh, share with you a little bit about the... Boy, would you have questions for me to answer so that uh, you, you get uh, what you want? <laughs> we, do, we do have a question actually about... Please. Sorry? Yes, please. Yes, um, we do have a question about would there be any like possible amendment of Chinese arbitration law, but I think we want to save that for the Q&A um, session. Um, thank you. Thank you for the briefly introducing the growth of Chinese arbitration and the success factors. Like, as you mentioned, fast, for the past few decades, China absolutely has been one of the fastest growing arbitration markets with its enormously expanding economy. And most likely it will continue to be one. As such a big player, like um, I think the world hopes China continuously carries its role as a contributor in improving arbitration as a mechanism of international dispute resolution. So um, as mentioned, um, we are going to, if we have enough time, we're going to ask you about like the possible areas that Chinese arbitration law can make improvement. And um, because of the time, 
Yes, because of the will, limit of the time. I will make, uh, give you a short answer, so, so I won't spend too much time there. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, the arbitration law is to be revised for sure, mm -hmm. uh, because it has been taken into consideration by the National Congress, and it's been um, absorbed in its national uh, plan of, of, of five-year legislation plan, and it's now being studied uh, actually by the Minister of, Minister of Justice, uh, to be specific. Uh, that's a, a, a answer on the amendment. And the other uh, important uh, issue I did to share with you that uh, uh, because of uh, for the um, uh, one build one road initiative and uh, uh, better the, uh, uh, combination with the um, uh, international transactions and disputes there, uh, the so-called ICD puzzle, that's the International Center for the Dispute uh, Prevention and the Resolution, uh, and the Resolution Center uh, was established last uh, October uh, in China uh, to um, echo the course or to um, uh, meet the need internationally, to, uh, not just to, to resolve disputes, but to prevent disputes. Mm. internationally. Mm -hmm. the another important uh, phenomenon is that uh, uh, CIMAC, the China Maritime Arbitration Commission, established its uh, second headquarter in Shanghai. That's a commercial capital somehow uh, for, for China. Um, the third one, um, uh, phenomenon should be mentioned is that uh, in China, quite a number of uh, institutions for arbitration has been renamed as uh, International Commercial Application Centers. For example, uh, let's see, Wuhan, uh, let's see, uh, Nanwang. These uh, uh, opportunity commissions were um, uh, ordinarily called, let's see, uh, Wuhan Opportunity Commission. But now it got a new name, it's the uh, Wuhan International Commercial Application Center. It's not the uh, individual example. There are a number of this sort of institutions. Or they have uh, established uh, important branches, independent branches to be um, responsible for international arbitrations. Okay, I think I should start there so that we'll have better time or what time to do that uh, later on and for others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen. We're definitely going to come back to you. And so far, we've heard from Anna Maria and Dr. Chen about the latest arbitration updates in both the Nordic region and China. With that in background, we would like to move on to arbitral institutions. Kirsten. Thank you very much, David and Dr. Chen. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ms. Evelina Wallström, Legal Counsel at the Arbitration Institute of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. Um, she's going to share about SEC updates and the lessons learned through the COVID pandemic. Ms. Evelina Wallström is a Swedish educated legal counsel with a master's in, uh, in law degree from Örebro University, but is located just two hours from Stockholm. Uh, Ms. Wallström has been working at the SEC for eight years, and in addition to the case management work, which is a lot because they have a small team for a lot of arbitration cases, she's also legal counsel in charge of the SEC's escrow services. Before joining the SEC, Ms. Wallström worked for the Svea Court of Appeal in Stockholm. And Ms. Wallström also has experience from the insurance sector and the pharmaceutical industry. Ms. Wallström is board member of the Young Arbitrators Sweden, YAS, Association for Young Arbitration Practitioners, and they have more than 400 members in Sweden and abroad. As a board member of YAS, uh, their aim is to provide a platform for networking and exchanging knowledge in the arbitration community to increase know-how and specialist knowledge in arbitration among young professionals in commercial arbitration. So without further ado, I welcome Ms. Evelina Wallström. Evelina, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I, firstly, I would like to, to start to, by thanking you, Kirsten, and David and Brian for so kindly inviting me to speak today. Um, it's with such a distinguished panel of colleagues over here. So I'm a bit nervous, I must admit, but I think this will go well. Uh, I'm in good hands, I feel at least. <laughs> um, so um, I was asked to just give a brief introduction to, to the SEC and I will try. It worked well during our um, uh, 
beginning here. So share my screen with you guys. Hopefully that will work. Perfect. Something like this, yes. So uh, like Kirsten mentioned, uh, the SEC are most likely considered a small institute um, when looking at our 10 member team at the Secretariat, but we administer quite a, quite a caseload each year actually. Each legal council, and there's three of us, manage approximately 60 to 65 pending cases at each given time. Uh, and the last year, we I think the numbers are not out yet, the statistics, uh, so this is brand new. Uh, last year, we hit the second highest number of new cases in our 104-year-old history, actually, with 213 new cases. The record year was in 2009, and the, then we had 216 new cases. So... Uh, Comparing this number to the amount of 175 new cases in 2019, one can't help but wonder whether the pandemic has something to do with it. And the short answer to that question is, we don't know. Uh, looking at the caseload of 2020, there are a handful of cases where the COVID-19 virus has been referenced in the, in the request of arbitration, but that's pretty much it. The main discussion where the pandemic has been a hot potato ha has been when the case has been referred to the arbitral tribunal and the discussion of a hearing has come up. So, um, this, this discussion was actually such a hot potato that we decided to conduct a survey with SEC arbitrators to learn more about the use and attitudes towards using virtual hearings in international and domestic arbitration. So, um, responses were received from arbitrators in 78 cases, 61 of which had, been re had reached the post-hearing stage of the proceedings at the time of the survey. None of the cases related none of the cases related to, to dispute that were caused by the COVID-19 and one dispute was aggravated or accelerated by it. And of these 61 arbitrations that had been finalized at the time of the survey, a virtual hearing had been held in 23 cases. So 23 of 61. An in-person hearing took place in as many as 30 arbitrations. 20 of those involved Swedish parties only. Uh, and that is uh, a relatively high share of in-person hearings in, in these special times. Uh, but it must be viewed in the context of Sweden's much publicized, uh, or should I say infamous, approach to managing the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, however, one must admit that in arbitrations involved, involving Swedish parties only, hearings typically require little or no travel at all. And uh, almost all arbitrators involved reported that special arrangements uh, had been made due to the restrictions, sort of like hand sanitizers, um, not too many people in the room and keeping the, the, the social distancing to, to a maximum. Um, and also uh, spreading the hearing days uh, just so that you don't have all the witness, he witness interrogations at the same day, for instance, and trying to... to followed the restrictions as best they could. Uh, so uh, one interesting thing that we saw that the survey showed that five of the 23 virtual hearings were conducted over the objection of the respondent. And one award has been challenged on grounds relating to this virtual hearing and is currently pending at the Svea Court of Appeal. And deciding a similar case recently, the Austrian Supreme Court rejected an argument that the virtual hearing violated due process and confirmed the arbitral tribunal's power to hold uh, remote hearings over the objection of a party. So this saga, I guess, will continue on for a bit. We're uh, monitoring it and we will uh, see what happens, basically. But as you might have seen and heard in uh, uh, in social media, the SEC leaves, encourages virtual hearings um, if the tribunal and the parties find it appropriate. And uh, not surprisingly, we found that hearings um, move online to a larger extent than before. 
And most arbitrators actually reported that they are likely to continue to use virtual hearings both during and post COVID-19, uh, which I personally think it's the it's a very good development, um, given that the, the main advantages that were seen from this survey was the uh, time, of, time efficiency, cost, um, convenience, and also environmental impact. So I, I hope it's encouraged, and I think um, uh, it should be encouraged as best we can. Thank you so much. Valina, I think what one what I think maybe some may not know is that SEC um, has always been a front runner in innovative and technological you know aspects to managing arbitrations, and it's fascinating that how a team of three can manage all of the arbitrations you know that come <laughs> through the SEC doors, and it's it's really a testament to how um, productive and technologically adaptive the SEC is. And you've come up with new rules to keep up with the commercial realities and the demands of users. Um, I just also wanted to share that there is an international caseload that is separate from the Swedish cases, and there's an international board of the SEC. And so I was wondering, in the cases that you mentioned, uh, where you allowed, um, you know, virtual hearings, were they mostly international or were they domestic arbitrations? Yeah, uh, to a larger extent, it was the international, were the international cases that moved online. And I think one reason for that is uh, we have a sort of 50-50% um, uh, when it comes to domestic and international cases. And I would say that without knowing the, the most current statistics, I would say that approximately 40-50% of the domestic cases are uh, co conducted under the expedited rules. And the main idea with the expedited rules that no hearing should really take place because the, the award are to be rendered within three months from referral. So there, there's a shortage of time, which also makes it, uh, well, it's intended for smaller cases where not necessarily a hearing needs to be held, while the international arbitrations tend to be a bit bigger, a bit more complex. And also, I would say that our international users are in a way more prone to request a hearing to be held. So I, I would say that mainly international cases were more uh, uh, eager to, to use the virtual hearings and also for, for with the travel restrictions, obviously, in, in mind. Um, it would, would basically be the party's only choice should they wish to have a, a quick award be rendered. Um, otherwise, we, we would have to postpone the case. I mean, you all probably remember we were really optimistic at the beginning of last year, I think it's rescheduling all conferences and events for, for, the, for the autumn of 2020. And now we're a bit hesitant to book stuff uh, in person this autumn. So. <laughs> Definitely. And we want to keep arbitrations efficient, right? And yes. expediting a lot. Yeah. So. And, and that, I think, brings me to the next issue. I think the SEC has developed a robust case management platform. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about the SEC platform. Yes, I would love to. Uh, this is something we're really proud of. Um, so little did we know in 2019 how timely the launch of the SEC platform would be. But uh, as it turns out, it has greatly served our users uh, during this pandemic. And uh, what the SEC platform is, it's a secure digital platform for com communication and file sharing between the SEC, the arbitrators and the parties um, in SEC arbitrations. And this kind of service has been in demand for, for years by practitioners in our industry. And it has also been on our to-do list for, <laughs> for quite a number of years. But it, it, finally, in August of 2018, we were able to actually sit down and properly discuss what we wanted to achieve and how we, what we needed to do to get there. And the result of those discussions, you can see a sneak peek of on your screen at the moment. Um, and this is what it actually looks like. Obviously, uh, due to confidentiality, these are make mock cases that you see. And perhaps you can see um, uh, on your right that Annette Magnusson, our Secretary General, General has uh, is a claimant representative in this mock <laughs> case. So but this is what it actually looks like. 
Great. And as you can see, there are two different colors. I will go into that uh, if I have the time a, a bit later. Um, so um, we, ha we have um, a variety of setups that the, the parties together with the arbitral tribunal can, so you can, within limits, of course, the, the parties and the arbitrators may uh, sort of mold their own site. So each case get a site, a designated site on the SEC platform where we uh, give out access to, to counsel and arbitrators involved in this arbitration. And those are the only people that are allowed to that site. So even if the platform's the same, each individual case has its individual site. And um, from on that site, the parties and the arbitrators may decide on a folder structure, which is better for them. Obviously, if you're in a domestic uh, arbitration under the expedited rules, you perhaps are in no need of a really advanced and complex folder structure because there, there won't be that many documents basically. So you can choose folder A for instance, which is the most basic one. And then we have up to fo folder C, which is a really more advanced one. So you can sort uh, your folders. So um, yeah, oh, sorry. Great. Uh, no, and Evelyn, I think the good benefit is that everything is one in one place, right? And that's yes. how efficiency is, is promoted. Yes, and we are going even, uh, well, we, we continue to, to develop the platform. It has uh, really many features that we are going to, to launch. And, but the most current one that we are working on right now is actually moving our internal case administration onto the SEC platform as well. Uh, because as of now, we are working in, in two different systems. And we have also, I think it's actually... A, you are able to do this right now, but as an arbitration practitioner, you are able to submit your CV straight into onto the SEC platform through our website, should you be interested in arbitrator appointments under the SEC rules. And these are inf that's information that is really useful and helpful for us to see your qualifications if you are interested in appointments. Great. Especially <laughs> important if you're thinking of which arbitrator to appoint. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, due to the, the arbitration, arbitrators and, and counsel t taking basically the SEC platform to heart uh, from, from the very start and um, given a giving a receipt of its user friend friendliness, which was one of the important things for us while developing the platform. Platform. It should be easy to use. It should be as straightforward as possible to, to be able to, to convince the community to, to use it because this will, will be our sole means of communication once we are, are done with all the work. So, and I think it, it's, uh, it's received a really good um, welcome from the, from the community. And I think, um, yeah, like you mentioned, Kirsten, uh, everything in one place here. Um, you can see all the participants to the arbitrations, tribunal notices, which, which is sort of like a blog function uh, where you can, the idea of the tribunal notices is that uh, to replace an email. Like when having a short conversations or short questions that you don't really need to submit a, to file a submission for, but you rather send an email to avoid using email, you can use the tribunal notices instead for this. You also have um, access to a case calendar to, and the, on the website, you can uh, add notifications which gives, sends you an email that now something has happened on the, on the case site. Uh, on the SEC platform. So you will be able to, to log on straight away and, and see what has happened. So you don't, you don't miss anything. You don't need to be constantly logged on to the SEC platform, but you can uh, get receive notifications, which is really good, I think. <laughs> yes, wonderful. I think uh, it just shows the efficiency and organization uh, in, in the SEC platform, making it robust for online arbitrations. Yeah. Um, and this is especially useful, perfect timing for the COVID years, I think. Definitely, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, perfect. Um, so we cannot wait to see if there are future, you know, upgrades, although the SEC is always, you know, trying to innovate. So we cannot wait to see their, <laughs> uh, you know, developments down the road. Um, 
So thank you so much for sharing this with us. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, just a, a few few last words, perhaps, uh, on, on this topic. Uh, you, you were kind enough to, to call us innovative. And uh, of course, we, we love to call ourselves innovative. And um, looking forward, what is it the SEC up to next? And to, to answer that question, I'll have to cite pretty much every influencer out there. I have some big news, but I'm not allowed to tell you yet. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot wait to hear. Stay tuned. Stay Thank you tuned. so much. Right. Thank you so much, Evelina. And I wanted to share that in the COVID times, Annette shared with us yesterday that, you know, uh, she picked up a a box of like uh, COVID supplies from China. Yeah. So really, yeah. it goes to show that good relationship cross institutional and um, also regional uh, collaboration is fantastic. Uh, Definitely. That photo. It was really, really heartwarming. Yeah. Um, and it was so appreciated, even though the Swedish government, uh, I think they are, they still refuse to force us to wear a face mask. Now they recommend us to do it. And it's been uh, amazing because um, we are working remotely at the Secretariat, but at, each day we need to have at least two people present at the office. So for those uh, travel, it's uh, invaluable. Well, thank you so much. Thank uh, you so much. Uh, I now hand it over to David um, to introduce E. Jun from KSAV. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you very much, Evelina, on the latest SEC updates. Um, <clears throat> I know we're out of time, but I must add one more. SEC has done a great job with your website. I visited several times to prepare this webinar to do my homework, and I became a frequent user, to be honest. It's just oh. beautifully organized. Thank you so much. I will tell our communications <laughs> officer. She'd be super excited. <laughs> and a team of three. Unbelievable. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, we have really good case administrators, luckily for us, that are, helps us organize everything. So much appreciated. I can tell. I can tell. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we're moving on. Now we have here a non-Chinese, non-Nord-Scandinavian panelist, Ms. ji Park from the Korean Commercial Arbitration Board. We asked ji to join us because we really wanted to hear about Chinese arbitration from a third party perspective as a foreign arbitral institution in China. Ms. Park is the director and chief representative of KCAB International Shanghai office. So she's located in China as a representative of a Korean arbitral institution. And her key role is to promote KCAB in China and manage ADR consultation for multinational companies. Um, prior to her current role, she had experience in managing compliance at a foreign private company in China. And she also worked at a Chinese arbitral institution. So ji uh, this might be a little broad, but based on your experience, what do you think is the role of a foreign arbitral institution in China and what are the prospects? So thank you for interesting me, David. But, oh, I must say that like good morning and good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, all around the world. And it is a great privilege and honor for me to participate in this CIAB ADR World Tour and presents in front of you. So today I will talk about our role and future of Foreign Arbitration Institute in China. And uh, let me share my slides first. Okay. So, first, KCAB established Shanghai office in 2017 to better support the settlement of commercial disputes between Korea and China, also to meet the needs of Chinese arbitration users. Within the last five years, KCAB Shanghai experienced a great development of international arbitration in China. China's numerous arbitration institutes are doing their best efforts to expand the international arbitration market. Over the past five years, CTEC's case number of arbitration has increased with a growth rate of 65%. And in the meantime, Shanghai International Arbitration Center increased 175%. 
China, as could be seen in the growth rates, is rapidly gaining experience in international arbitration and is looking forward to greater development in the future. However, it is not only arbitration centers that are making such progress. In 2019, a total of 32 international arbitration awards were recognized and enforced by the Chinese People's Court, and only one case was rejected. Although it is true that China's arbitration uses and its openness have improved over the last years, it is hard to say that Chinese arbitration market is like 100% fully open to foreign arbitration institutes. Article 10 of the China Arbitration Law stipulates that only the Chinese arbitration commissions in mainland China has right to arbitrate in China as the seat of arbitration, adding that the arbitration committee must be registered to the Chinese administrations. In addition, Article 16 of the Arbitration Law stipulates that a valid arbitration agreement must designate a legitimate arbitration commission. Thus, it is still unclear whether a foreign arbitration institute established in China is a legitimate arbitration commission admitted by China. Furthermore, the validity of the combined arbitration clause is under dispute as well. In this context, the Guangzhou Intermediate People's Court's ruling of Brentwood Industry and Fanlong Engineering concluded in August 2020 is very significant. Guangzhou Intermediate People's Court not only recognized the validity of the combined arbitration clause in the case, but also recognized the decision of ICC arbitration tribunal that referred China as the seat of arbitration. To be precise, the court classified the decision as a Chinese domestic case in China and executed in based on Article 273 of Chinese Civil Procedure Act, not the New York Convention. This ruling by the Chinese court, who was formally considered conservative, fully showed a change of our foreign arbitrations in this case. China began to show a friendly attitude toward foreign arbitration institutes starting 2015. China's state council previously allowed foreign arbitration institutes to open representative office in Shanghai Free Trade Zone in 2015 through the development of reform and open progress in Chinese Free Trade Zone. Accordingly, KCAB, SIAC, HKIAC, and ICC opened representative offices in Shanghai. However, these offices are limited to promotion works and are not allowed to provide case management services in the mainland China. Soon after, on August 6 of 2019, the State Council announced the total plan for China Shanghai Free Trade Zone in Lingang New Area, which we, now I'm going to call it Shanghai Plan. That in the Article 4 of this measure allows foreign arbitration institutes to be registered as business organization and manage cases in China. Also, registered foreign arbitration institutes are allowed to apply for interim measures that can provide more efficient arbitration services to both Chinese and foreign parties. From January 1st, 2021, the State Council of China implemented the Beijing Plan. This has basically the same contents as of Shanghai Plan, but the rules are more specified than the Shanghai Plan in 2019. This has given Shanghai and Beijing a greater motivation to develop into leading international arbitration hub in the Asia-Pacific region. Currently in China, KCAB, ICC, SIAC, HKAIC, and WIPO has 
established its office. Among them, KCAB, ICC, SIAC, and HKIAC has registered as a represented office, which only performs promotion and cooperation role. And WIPO has recently registered as a case managing office, possible to conduct case managing. KCAB has entrusted Shanghai representative office, including but not limited to the following functions. First, promoting KCAB ADR services to potential and current ADR users in China. Second, concluding consulting about ADR services in Korea and KCAB. Third, supporting resolve Korea-related commercial di disputes. Fourth, China-related arbitration studies and trend research. And last but not least, liaising with national or regional ADR commissions in China. These are the key functions of representative offices of foreign arbitration institutes. It is unclear to what extent the representative can intervene in the case. Therefore, representatives who do not have the authority to, be, to manage cases have no choice but to passive in case attraction and arbitration consulting. Therefore, most representatives put the greatest importance on promoting institutions. In order to expand the scope of the representative office's business, it must be re-registered as a case managing office in the Shanghai Lingang Free Trade Zone or the Beijing Free Trade Zone. The scope of its work can be seen through the Beijing plan. The Beijing plan includes the registration of ADR institutes in Beijing to provide arbitration services to commercial disputes arising from international trades and investments and legitimate support and guarantees of interim measures. However, the regulation did not specify a clear scope of activities of foreign arbitration institutes for, to perform in Beijing. For example, it is likely but unclear whether representative offices registered in Beijing will be allowed to have arbitration hearing facilities or even provide hearing services. In addition, both free trade zone areas in Shanghai and Beijing are remoted for about like two hours from the downtown, which is not very effective considering the convenience of arbitration users. The KCAB is focusing on these changes and is seriously considering the future development of the Shanghai representative office. So China is one of the largest trading partner of most countries around the world. China's numerous trading inevitably causes a lot of cosmological disputes as well. China has emerged as Korea's largest trading partner since 2004. The need for arbitration between Korea and China is likely to grow further as trade increases. Therefore, it is very important to understand Chinese arbitration market properly. The foreign arbitration institutes need to accurately identify such trends and report them to the headquarters. Through its effort, it is easier to provide more efficient ADR services and pre prevent future disputes. Studying Chinese arbitration not only helps the foreign institutes, but it also plays a major role in promoting Chinese arbitration abroad. Representative offices can promote Chinese development while trading more events. It is particularly and practically difficult for Chinese arbitration agencies to deliver all trends to institutions in different languages around the world. However, the foreign arbitration offices replacement of this role has greatly helped China grow into a hub of international arbitration. Not only that, foreign arbitration agencies with accumulated experience in international arbitration are delivering their know-how in China. Like opening the arbitration market to foreign arbitration agencies in Shanghai and Beijing clearly shows China's willingness to take the ADR environment to the next level. 
this must be a positive sign for Foreign Arbitration Institute that drives its roles in China. For this change to happen, the key is whether the actual implement of the opening measures will result in specific guidelines through local policies and court decisions, or stable, like, stable regulations through the revision of the Chinese arbitration law. Foreign arbitration institutes in China is expecting so much for the future development of Chinese international arbitration. Well, we have limited time, so I will stop my presentation here. And if you have any question, I'm here to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Jiyun. That was uh, such an informative presentation with uh, great detail. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And um, we now have heard from all panel members about the latest developments and the perspectives from arbitral institutions. I see that um, we have already passed our promised schedule and being conscious of um, everyone's time, instead of a full Q&A, how about a succinct final comment from the panel? You can add anything to your prior speeches or something you thought of while listening to others. How about we start with um, Dr. Chan? Okay, well, Dr. Yes, oh, okay. thank you, David. Uh -huh. uh, I will actually um, give a little bit more information to you that might be helpful. Uh, the first one is that uh, it's highly likely that um, when the Chinese arbitration law is amended uh, in years, uh, in recent years, uh, the uh, uh, mandatory kind of arbitrators system will be abolished. In other words, the parties in the future won't be limited by the kind uh, of arbitrators prepared by the institutions channel. You can choose anybody you wish to act as uh, your arbitrator in your case. That's one point. The other point is that uh, uh, online arbitration will be recognized uh, very highly likely uh, when the amendment uh, is finished for the arbitration law uh, in China. Uh, the third one is that uh, the uh, competence competence doctrine will also be uh, uh, recognized later on in the amendment of the arbitration law, very highly likely. Now, for all these three points I've just made or suggested, uh, comes from, they come from the consensus of all the people, um, practitioners and researchers on arbitration when talking about the amendment of, amendment of the arbitration law. But that's what I'd like to add for the information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen. Evelina? Yes, thank you. Um, I basically have just a, a few comments regarding the, the virtual hearings that, uh, that we at least uh, expect to see more of, whether we like it or not. And I, I would just like to, as, as a final tip, to, to be able to, to endure uh, the, the virtual hearings, uh, in the words of one of the, the responding arbitrators to our survey, keep calm and prepare. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Jiyun? Yes. So I want to add about the like very recent developments of Chinese like arbitration market that recently infrastructure for international arbitration has been built throughout China and Shanghai International Dispute Resolution Resolution Center already has like ICC and SIAC representative office in the center and Shenzhen IDRC is ready to open soon in this year. Like following Seoul IDRC built in 2013 to attract more foreign arbitration users and institutes in Korea, I believe this these ADR facilities will also help China to develop as an international ADR hub as well. Thank you, Jiyun. Um, on behalf of Anna Maria, she conveyed, she asked me to convey sincere apologies. She had to leave early because of prior commitments. So, 
And I guess it's time for us to close our webinar. First of all, thank you everyone for your participation and my most sincere gratitude to the panel members, Anna Maria, Avelina, Dr. Chan, and Jiyun for sharing your valuable knowledge and insights. It was an honor and also an exciting experience for myself. And I'm pretty sure Kirsten feels the same. <laughs> and we really hope to have another opportunity to work together in the near future. Also, thank you to Char for hosting this event, the global sponsors, KCAB, Cardozo Law, collaborating organizations, of course, SEC, SAA, and CAAL for your support. And of course, special thanks to my dear colleagues, Brian and Kirsten for being such a great team. Lastly, play, please stay tuned for the remaining four weeks of the ADR World Tour. The next destination is the Middle East and Turkey. Thank you, everyone. Stay so safe and healthy. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Chen. You. Thank you, Evelina. Thank you, so Thank you so much. You're a great player. I'm so sorry that I can't show you uh, my, my uh, Well, experience. next time Again, we do I it, do. next time we do it, I'm, I'm sure that you can show us your face. <laughs> <laughs> or hopefully in person, we'll have an in-person conference sometime. Cross-institutional collaboration. Yes. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> Sounds good. 2022, yes. here we come. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.